This is Dave Bortner, Freedom Boat Service. We're celebrating our 10th anniversary in business, and we happened to run across these cassette tapes that were produced as part of the Antique Motorboating Symposium uh, March 31st through April 2nd of 1995 at the Mariner's Museum. We thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to digitize these presentations by icons and luminaries of our hobby. We hope you enjoy listening to them and uh, join us in celebrating our 10 years in business. Thanks. This file is a fascinating look at the world of commuters or yachts in a hurry, uh, as the book by the same name uh, termed it. This is a discussion by Phil Moore and Robert Mackey, who were the authors of Yachts in a Hurry. And it's a, a very interesting look into the kind of local aspect of in and around New York City, East Coast, Long Island, uh, of the commuter yachts of the 20s and 30s. Two very distinguished gentlemen here to talk to you about a fascinating portion of American boating history. Uh, I have not seen the program, but I understand that it's a kind of a dynamic duo in which one talks about the social implications, the other talks about the boating. These two gentlemen, as I said, are eminently qualified. Phil has owned a commuter and written a book and done an enormous amount of research. Bob Mackay does his boating in a 38-foot uh, Chris Craft commuter and is very interested in boating subjects. The, uh, I, I'm, if you have not seen it, the book by Phil and the foreword by Bob Mackay were reviewed uh, by none less than Bill Buckley in the New York Times book review section, and he, he described both of these things, the book and the foreword, foreword in very glowing terms. Please uh, welcome Phil and Bob. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean. Can everybody hear me? Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to start off, as Dean suggested, and talk a little bit about this phenomenon of commuting to work. Um, and uh, then Phil will follow me with uh, information on the remarkable boats that, that were used to, uh, to commute with. Um, we also found some more copies of the book. So if you wanted one yesterday and couldn't get one, uh, there are some uh, outside right now at the registration desk. The New York Herald reported in 1902 that an enormous fleet of private yachts regularly plied the waters of Long Island Sound, carrying their owners at racing speed twice daily from their great estates to the wharfs on Manhattan Island nearest their offices. And indeed, um, as early as the 1890s, uh, commuting to work seems to have been a phenomenon uh, in New York waters and was quickly to become a phenomenon uh, around other cities, Boston and Detroit, and, and uh, 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 to a certain extent, uh, Miami and, and uh, yet others. Uh, among the uh, earliest commuters uh, of record uh, commuting into New York City was Charles Pratt, uh, the president of the Pratt Illuminating Oil Company, who was soon to merge his uh, uh, Brooklyn-based refinery with uh, Mr. Rockefeller's business to form Standard Oil. And here we see uh, his uh, Seabury-built steam commuter, uh, the Allegra, uh, uh, making its, its run in uh, to the city. Uh, Mr. Pratt had a uh, compound, a great uh, uh, complex uh, uh, at uh, Glen Cove, which uh, uh, future generations were to build on. He had five sons. They all built houses there, and many of the grandchildren. Eventually, there were to be 25 estates in the Pratt compound known as Desaurus uh, at Glen Cove. Um, 
The, um, some of those estates are still famous. One is the Russian UN summer embassy. Uh, and another, the movie Sabrina was filmed. And uh, the Pratts were to become one of the greatest commuting families. There, there were probably more commuters owned by the Pratts than any other uh, single family. Um, Could we focus um, the one on the left screen? Um, their destination uh, was often um, uh, the 24th Street docks of the New York Yacht Club. The New York Yacht Club maintained a station on the East River specifically for the commuters, uh, but it wasn't the only station. The River Club, the Columbia Yacht Club uh, on the Hudson River, a great powerboat yacht club, uh, also had uh, docks, uh, and after dropping off their owners, the commuters would raft up uh, two, three, sometimes four abreast. Uh, here we see uh, pic pictures taken, I believe, on the same day, uh, one uh, on the right showing the density, and, and then as you step back and look at the 24th Street docks from a distance, I think Morris Rosenfeld was leaning out a... a uh, window of an office building to take the picture on the, on the left screen, uh, you see that uh, in the distance there are other vessels. And this is an important point. While there is a type of boat uh, called a commuter, not everybody commuted in commuters. Uh, some commuted uh, in great steam yachts. Others commuted in little launches. Charlie Payson, um, the, uh, whose daughter became the first owner of the Mets baseball team, as a young man commuted in a yacht tender that had proved too heavy for davit use. And uh, he said this worked out quite well until he hit a mattress, a submerged mattress, at speed in the East River, and uh, quickly moved to bigger boats after that. And, and eventually, of course, owned Saga, had Saga built the, that one of the really glorious commuters, uh, which... Uh, I was later owned by Phil Moore and led Phil into his uh, work on the commuters. Here is an example of a, a larger vessel used for commuting. On the right, you see the Glen Cove, Long Island estate of uh, a Captain Delamar. Looks more like uh, Disney World from here, doesn't it? Unbelievable estate. And, uh, here is May, his uh, steam yacht that uh, he used to uh, head into Manhattan, a distance of about 20 miles. Uh, and if you uh, look carefully uh, in the left corner of the right screen, you can actually see May anchored off his place. And apparently, uh, Captain Delamar uh, uh, didn't need to uh, uh, get to the office on time because May wasn't very quick. And uh, so not everyone needed to race to, the, to work. Uh, the first uh, J.P. Morgan uh, also commuted by steam yacht. Uh, now, in the New York area, the uh, commuters were coming in from uh, virtually every point of the compass. They were uh, coming down the Hudson River, Nelson Rockefeller before he turned to politics, was a, a, a commuter by water. Uh, they were coming up from the Jersey Shore. Uh, an example of a Jersey Shore, early Jersey Shore commuter would be the uh, vessel on the uh, left screen, Sovereign, M.C. Borden, Sovereign, uh, an early flyer, uh, uh, very uh, quick boat. Um, they were also coming from the uh, Connecticut Shore, uh, from places like uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, and Darien, from Long Island's North Shore, from Manhasset Bay, from Glen Cove, from Oyster Bay, from Cold Spring Harbor, and even from the South Shore of Long Island, which is uh, from the Great South Bay, where uh, they had to negotiate a very shallow bay before getting out through the uh, Fire Island inlets into the ocean and coming around that way. An example of a Connecticut commuter uh, would have been 
gem uh, built for Mr. Jeremiah Milbank, an investment banker, and uh, known today as Jessica. She's had just three owners in uh, her history from the late 20s. And uh, her captain, Captain Raymond Toms, uh, has served all three owners. I think this is something like his 48th or 9th year as the official captain of, of Jessica. And he started with Mr. Milbank and uh, has served the subsequent owners. Uh, currently, uh, Mr. the owner is Mr. Ted Valpe. And uh, in 1991, we had uh, the second of our commuter rendezvous, uh, this one in the New York area, uh, and had um, uh, a number of, of uh, the Chris Craft 38-footers and a number of consolidated and other custom commuters uh, together for a wonderful week, ending with a mystic boat show, but starting with a run into New York. Uh, and for the run into New York, we rounded up as many CEOs of corporations as we could find and had um, the commuters assigned to bring them in from uh, places like Greenwich and Oyster Bay. And uh, that day, um, we all reached the East River at about the same time and were racing at times abreast down the East River toward Wall Street. And one boat would work its way a little ahead, and then another boat would work its way a little ahead. And um, Captain Toms was in his wheelhouse. And as he saw this scene and the buildings flashing by, uh, he was murmured, he was heard to, to murmur, just like old times. <laughs> An example of a commuter from the South Shore would have been uh, George Bourne, the Singer Sewing Machine uh, magnate. Mr. Bourne had a, an immense estate uh, uh, at Oakdale. Uh, it's now the LaSalle uh, Military Academy. And here we see on the left screen uh, one of his launches in the foreground, a rather small boathouse behind it. And then uh, on the, the, the uh, right, um, a, uh, you can just see his immense uh, uh, mansion built by the same, uh, or designed by the same architect who did Annapolis, and about as big as Annapolis, actually, uh, <laughs> right in the very right corner uh, of that scene. You can just see the stern of, of one of his uh, commuters. He had a brace of commuters. And commuters were, were often useful uh, for other things, uh, when uh, the CEOs went on vacation, they take them, uh, use their commuters to get to Newport or, or in Mr. Uh, Bourne's case, uh, all the way to the Thousand Islands. And um, there are pictures of uh, uh, his commuters uh, tied up at, at uh, his island um, in the Thousand Islands. Uh, and uh, so uh, it... it uh, it made more than, than just a commute into the city. But of all the areas around New York, uh, Long Island certainly was the center of the commuting phenomenon, and for, for good reason. Uh, on the, the left screen, uh, could we focus that a little bit? If some, uh, I guess no one is, is, is near that. OK, there, OK, perfect. On the left screen, you can see the bridges connecting Long Island with Manhattan in uh, 1938. And for those of you who know this area, you'll, you'll realize that the two tunnels had yet to be built, that um, three of the bridges were way down near the tip of Manhattan, near Wall Street, and connected to Brooklyn, um, not, really to, not really convenient to the North Shore of Long Island. And it was only the span on the right screen, the 59th Street Bridge, uh, which connects to the North Shore. And it doesn't connect very well, because the parkways had yet to be built. Robert Moses' system of parkways, uh, including the Northern State Parkway, uh, did not come into existence until the late 30s. 38 was the, the uh, Triborough Bridge connection. And um, so Long Island uh, beckoned, perhaps, uh, as a, as a resort area, um, as an area of, with a, a good climate and wonderful uh, 
bays and deep harbors, but it was hard to get there. And uh, for that reason, uh, no one even thought about living out there uh, without a commuter. And we, uh, as we continue to research this, we are finding uh, that virtually every estate uh, on the water or near the water uh, has a commuter connected with it. And uh, recently, the building uh, papers for uh, the mansion on the left screen were discovered uh, in, in the vault in the basement of this house. This is the estate of a Mr. Wilton Lloyd Smith at Lloyd Neck some 30 miles distant from Manhattan. And Mr. Uh, Lloyd Smith's uh, construction papers for his uh, Bertram Grosvenor Goodhue design mansion are all interspersed with invoices uh, from Consolidated for his new commuter, Argo, seen on the right screen. Clearly, Mr. Wilton Lloyd Smith could not conceive of living at such a distant place without a re reliable way of getting into the city. Uh, because these were uh, these commuter owners were uh, uh, by and large not not coupon clippers but uh, uh, businessmen who uh, might want to reside in the country during the time of year that that the country um, appealed but had to keep in touch with events in the city had to keep in touch with their businesses and uh, we're really terrified of not being able to get back into the city. Uh, so the commuter uh, was less uh, a lark and really more of a necessity. Uh, quick to, to uh, figure this out were the, the builders, and there was no more famous builder of commuters than the Consolidated Ship, uh, uh, Shipbuilding Corporation. Uh, which had its great works on the Harlem River. Uh, Phil's going to tell you more about this firm. Um, but look at this ad on the right screen. Uh, Consolidated has a complicated history. It was the pro product of a merger between the gas engine and power company and the Charles L. Seabury company, uh, one the maker of small naphtha launches, the other the maker of large steam yachts. Uh, they combine and Seabury moves its operation to the Harlem River and um, they are known by this long uh, name for a while and eventually they shorten it to just consolidate it. Um, the, uh, their engines were known as Speedways and the name Speedway comes not from the marine uh, end at all but from uh, actually the equestrian end because right across from the consolidated site on the Harlem River was the great sort of proving grounds for uh, fancy carriage horses in New York City for your, your trotters. And um, that was a uh, dirt road that ran the length of the Harlem River. Now there's a big expressway there um, called the Speedway. So when consolidated started making engines, they uh, said, hmm, we'll, we'll name it for the track across the river from us. Um, note that the uh, ad on the right screen uh, says uh, that the uh, Seabury Yachts and Motors um, uh, with the Speedway engines uh, were as necessary to Long Island as the motor car. Uh, indeed they were. As time goes on, the ads get more sophisticated. Uh, the uh, manufacturers of engines and commuters like the Sterling Motor Company uh, uh, begin to understand that uh, the appeal of a uh, commuter yacht uh, is so great that it appeals to people who aren't interested in boating. Uh, that um, businessmen that um, uh, had no uh, previous experience in, in boating whatsoever and that the commuting yacht is this necessity to get out to uh, the Connecticut shore and um, uh, to uh, the North Shore above Chicago and to places like that um, had to do with the whole development of um, uh, country life, the so-called country life movement. Um, remember that in Victorian times, 
uh, when uh, businessmen went to the shore for uh, vacation, they tended to stay in a hotel for a few weeks. But by the early 20th century, there was a move to um, build one's own house in the country and to take advantage of all the new forms of recreation which were happening out there. And within about a decade, in the, in the late 1880s and 90s, uh, what comes to America? Golf comes to America. First, first golf course built in conjunction um, with a clubhouse uh, was built on Long Island in 1892. Uh, tennis uh, is making its debut in the 1880s. Um, all sorts of um, uh, equestrian sports and other sports. And so in this very clever ad of the Sterling Motor Company, what do we see but a famous Long Island country club transposed to the shore. It was actually way inland. And on the lawn of that country club, we see uh, all sorts of, of uh, recreationalists, all uh, with, with different uh, sporting implements. There's a tennis player, there's a golfer, there's a polo player. And um, the message here isn't so much hey, this commuter with our Sterling engines will get you to work on time. It's really the reverse of that. It's saying to the busy businessman, the workaholic who uh, never leaves the city, uh, you could access this whole new experiment in country living if you buy a commuter. Uh, why don't you think about uh, living in the country? And here's, here's the vehicle that's going to make it possible. Uh, so a very sophisticated ad, and here indeed is a list of, of mansion owners on Long Island, prominent residents of Long Island and their pleasure clubs, it says. And you see around this social list, this sort of blue list of this area, uh, vignettes of the various sports, of the, of the recreational possibilities. And it's really this desire to uh, get out and try these new forms of recreation to beat the heat and, and have a place by the shore for a, f uh, a few weeks that is driving um, the whole uh, development of commuters at this point. Whoops. Went too far there. Um, now we're going to be looking at a series of commuters um, all from one harbor. And this wasn't even an important harbor. Uh, but it's one near where I live, so I've uh, taken a particular research interest in it. And um, the first um, uh, uh, early commuter uh, coming out of uh, this area of, of uh, uh, Cold Spring Harbor, this is actually right around the corner, a town called Bayville, uh, was Winchester, one of a series of four built for the, the great Broadway uh, department store uh, King um, Broadway Rouse, as he was known, uh, and uh, actually uh, Broadway Rouse founded the, the fortune. Peter Rouse, his son, got to spend the fortune. And here is uh, Peter Rouse's um, uh, immense house at Bayville, um, Long Island. Uh, he, it, it, uh, big and, so big that it later became a hospital. And um, this is one of, of Mr. Rouse's um, Motors being exercised here by the chauffeur. I don't think that's Mr. Rouse himself. And then on the right screen, uh, the remarkable Winchester. And um, uh, Winchester was uh, upwards of 200 uh, feet in the last one. And yet in, in a commuter this big, uh, it was, uh, there was remarkably little space for the owner and his party. Uh, so that the amount of space dedicated to the boilers, the water tubes, the uh, coal lockers and whatnot took up, uh, and the crew, you needed a crew on an average steam commuter of at least six, took up most of the vessel. And the owner uh, and his party uh, had that little cabin way in the back, and uh, if the weather was good, maybe they could stand up there and in the exposed steering position. Uh, not not uh, uh, fast, perhaps, but not uh, particularly comfortable. So uh, we see the great transition uh, to uh, the gasoline engines happening uh, very quickly. And here, 
uh, we see another view of the last of the Winchesters um, at anchor uh, right at the uh, uh, separating point between Cold Spring Harbor and Oyster Bay, uh, where she, her night position before she would pick Mr. Rouse off his dock and rush him into the city. And a very rare picture of um, commuters underway. And here on the left screen, you see the Winchester racing forward. And she is trying to catch up with Arrow, um, which has the lead. And this is one of Arrow's crewmen sitting on her rail. Uh, it's interesting that um, uh, so few pictures exist of commuters being used, I guess, because going to work was a commonplace thing. You didn't take pictures of it. And uh, in uh, Phil's book, the, the pictures all are from the Rosenfeld collection, and they tend to be factory pictures. You know, they're just, they've just been launched by uh, their builders. They're, they're out in the Harlem River in front of Consolidated. They're, they look uh, crisp and, and uh, brand new. Um, but you don't see them with the, uh, you see them so rarely with owners on board actually making the compute, commute. So this is a, a, a wonderful one, and the uh, north shore of Long Island is off to the left as, as these two flyers are having it out, heading east down Long Island Sound. Um, here's uh, Arrow again, the boat that, that was in the lead in the last sequence. Uh, she, uh, sets the world speed record of 45.7 knots and uh, ought one. And uh, it goes through a series of owners before uh, being sold to J. Stewart Blackton, the Harmsworth Cup racer and early movie mogul. And this was uh, Mr. Blackton's boathouse on the right. How's that for a boat well? Uh, on Cold Spring Harbor. And uh, he apparently kept his Harmsworth racers inside, and that is, in, very interestingly, uh, Arrow, uh, in her winter quarters, tied up to the uh, uh, retaining wall there, uh, just to the right of the boathouse, and you can see the canvas cover over, um, and uh, this is post-season. Bill will be telling you a little more about Arrow in a minute. Now, uh, because of the uh, expense and, and relative inconvenience of the steam commuters, uh, as soon as we have the advent of the uh, high combustion uh, engine for aircraft use during World War I, and the relative availability of aircraft engines afterwards, such as the Liberty, um, you, you see a rapid changeover um, to gas power. And an early example um, for um, both the country and for, the, for Cold Spring Harbor, where, where uh, she commuted out of, uh, would have been the vessel on the right screen, Khorasan. Uh, this was Marshall Field III's uh, commuter, the son, grandson of the department store king, the, uh, who uh, had quite a distinguished career of his own, founded a newspaper in New York in the 30s called PM, which no longer survives, but which every journalism student in America knows about because it really set the tone for the way newspapers look today. And Mr. Corson, uh, Mr. Field had a house at, at uh, uh, way out at Lloyd Neck on the western, eastern side of Cold Spring Harbor and um, had um, Garwood uh, stuff, I think it was four liberties in uh, this commuter, um, which could get into the city uh, pretty damn quick. And on the uh, left screen, we see uh, Captain Jack Stafford, uh, the Corsan's uh, uh, captain, and, and his, uh, his two crew members. And so wh while the steam commuters needed six or seven, the gas commuters needed a crew of just uh, uh, three. Uh, and uh, in case you were wondering, the uh, linked liberties uh, used 100 gallons an hour. And it co uh, they ran through just one way now from Marshall Fields Estate into the city, 87 gallons one way. Um, so the, this, the gas bill for the season must have really been phenomenal. 
um, Captain Stafford was um, interviewed shortly before he died um, about five years ago uh, for an, uh, a magazine article. And he had many wonderful things to say about um, these years and, and working for Mr. Field. Um, but one of the uh, one of the more amusing comments he, he made was that a problem with owning a commuting yacht was that there were a lot of freeloaders that would appear, neighboring estate owners and that kind of thing. And uh, uh, for a while, I guess, Mr. Field ran uh, from the public dock in Cold Spring Harbor into the city. And uh, Captain Stafford is quoted in this article as saying, half the people at Cold Spring Harbor would get on the boat to ride in. It got so that there were a lot of people you didn't know, Mr. Field would say to me, uh, who's that, friend of yours? <laughs> I'd say, no, I thought he was a friend of yours. <laughs> and there's Marshall Field's estate, um, uh, Comset, uh, it's called, it's now a state park. And can we focus that one? And a picture of Mr. Field at this time. Uh, Mr. Field uh, eventually turns to seaplanes for the commute, flying in under the bridges to Wall Street, uh, and gives up uh, Corsan, probably at a, a great savings. Now, um, another commuter from, from the single harbor of Cold Spring uh, was Mike Matheson's um, great-grandfather, and uh, this was his estate on the right, uh, Fort Hill. You see William Matheson sitting on the uh, uh, balcony of his porch. Uh, he had, uh, was the chairman of the, I think it was called the American Alkaline Company, a dye company which merges into Allied Chemical, and from 1900 on had an estate uh, from which he commuted uh, on Lloyd Neck some 30 miles in. And uh, could, we get, could we focus that one on the other screen, please? And here's his commuter, Mara Pessa, uh, which uh, was uh, built by Mathis and uh, powered by Van Blerck engines. And Another picture of the Matheson Estate Fort Hill, a hard one to get a, get a good picture of because it is sculpted into this um, bluff in such a way that it's hard to get the whole house in, in one frame on the right screen. And you see uh, some of his other uh, boats. He was a, a true boater um, in a scene uh, on the left screen taken around the turn of the century and got quite a variety of craft here, um, including a steam engine. And it's interesting that uh, the Matheson family is still interested in steam engines um, after uh, four generations have, have occurred. Uh, another uh, commuter coming out of Cold Spring Harbor uh, was Whippet, um, built by the Greenport uh, boat and construction company, uh, basin and construction company at Greenport, Long Island, and uh, owned by one of the Standard Oil partners, Oliver Jennings, his house, uh, Burwood, on the uh, other screen. And whip it underway. And a picture now, can we focus that one, please? Of uh, um, Cold Spring Harbor. Um, the right uh, uh, on the left screen, and we're just running down one side of the harbor and picking off the estates and matching the estates up uh, with the commuters. Coming out of the of the bottom of the harbor, um, we seem to continually go out here with the focus on. The, there we go. Um, was uh, this remarkable uh, boat, Ohika, Ohika II, named for 
the, uh, the owner's estate, Ohika on the right screen, Ohika survives today and is still apparently considered to be the largest privately owned residence in America. Um, it was built by Otto Kahn, the investment banker, and is today owned by a Japanese gentleman who collects castles worldwide. In fact, I think he's the fellow who owns the Bourne Castle up in the Thousand Islands as well. Uh, Mr. Um, well, while most uh, of these commuter owners turn to uh, familiar uh, boat builders to, to uh, have their, their uh, craft constructed, uh, Mr. Khan um, went abroad uh, and used uh, German technology, uh, and so Ohika was built by the Maybach Zeppelin Corporation and powered with airship engines and could do for a big commuter um, uh, 37 miles per hour in period, which was uh, pretty good. Back one. Now, one of the rarest uh, things or, or pictures of commuters underway, as I was saying, and the uh, only two series that I know of, uh, other than the picture of Arrow leading Winchester 4 that we saw previously appeared in a magazine called Country Life uh, in America, a long defunct magazine. And um, this picture on the left screen shows what must have been a typical scene uh, morning and, and uh, afternoon uh, in New York uh, Harbor at this time, a commuter running under one of the bridges. They say that at rush hour, there were so many commuters in the East River that, that the East River was jammed. And um, hijinks all the time. You know, one, uh, uh, there were typically uh, commuters would pair off and race. There were two coming out of Oyster Bay every day that would race. And as we saw, Arrow and Winchester had something going. And um, when they'd get to obstacles in the river, such as Roosevelt Island, they would take... Uh, uh, either side of Roosevelt and then see who was ahead at the, after they had passed uh, the island. And uh, on the right, uh, we see a wonderful series of vignettes from Country Life of America, of the commuting experience. Um, this is a Mr. Kaiser of Glen Cove um, in the, uh, being shown here in the early 20s. He's being rowed out to his commuter steps on board, is handed the Wall Street Journal, settles into a comfortable wicker chair, and checks the stock prices uh, all before uh, breakfast is served by the steward. Now, of the three in crew, one was always the steward who would, could prepare uh, uh, breakfast and other meals, and, um, and uh, would uh, complete his uh, uh, breakfast before they got to the turbulent part of the East River at Hell Gate, or as J.P. Morgan's grandson uh, uh, has told us, your, your breakfast would end up in your lap. Um, uh, but uh, uh, all is done uh, in time for him to go forward to the pilot house and, and uh, take a look at the high rises as, as they near Wall Street, and you see him doing that in the last uh, vignette. Um, in another long defunct magazine called The Sportsman, wonderful magazine of the 20s and early 30s. Um, we see another series of vignettes uh, in an article here uh, entitled, And So to Work. And here we see Frolic, uh, Walter Chrysler's uh, commuter, and, and there's Mr. Chrysler um, greeting his uh, captain as he's about to get on or off. And um, uh, here, uh, Frolic, uh, again, a uh, John Wells uh, design. Um, and uh, as it nears uh, Manhattan, in, at the lower on the left, uh, here she is passing a, a slower s steam yacht as she heads toward the Hellgate Bridge. We looked at 
pictures of the New York Yacht Club's 24th Street docks uh, to start off with, but we didn't look in the other direction, and that's what we're doing now. Here's 24th Street again, but this time from the water back toward the land. And um, the club not only, the New York Yacht Club there uh, had not only docks, but a special clubhouse, uh, not their main city clubhouse, which was uptown, but a uh, special little clubhouse right at the docks for the commuters. Uh, so that uh, uh, if you finish work early and um, your vessel was still being gassed up or not quite ready to leave, maybe you were waiting for uh, a neighboring estate owner to, to, to arrive to, to uh, depart for Greenwich or wherever, you could uh, have a drink here, there was a bar, or play billiards. And they had a billiard room. <laughs> and uh, so this was uh, the way it worked, apparently. Uh, Phil and I gave this in New York on Thursday night um, at the New York Yacht Club, uh, and so we included some pictures of former Commodores here uh, of the Yacht Club. Here we see J.P. Morgan on board Nevet, his steam-powered uh, Hershoff-designed commuter, which is on the right screen, and um, it is said that uh, uh, J.P. Morgan uh, uh, didn't uh, much like the uh, uh, roar of combustion engines, so he kept his 1917 uh, steam Nevette uh, right into the 30s, long after uh, uh, the, the others had given up steam for uh, gasoline-powered craft. That's Morgan with the white hat and the pipe in his mouth on the left screen. That's his house on the right screen near Glen Cove. Uh, and indeed, it seems that everybody that was coming out to Long Island anyway at this point was bring, being brought out to, by commuter. One of the great events in Long Island's history of, of the period were the international polo matches in 1924, which attracted um, the... Uh, first visit of a future monarch, one of the only visits of, of, a, of a monarch to American soil at this time, the Prince of Wales, soon to be king and soon to abdicate the throne. And here is the prince in the business suit on board this express uh, cruiser um, uh, being uh, picked off the SS Berengaria in New York Harbor in 1924 and being taken out commuter fashion uh, to the mansion he was staying in on the North Shore of Long Island. Here is another um, Commodore of the New York Yacht Club, George F. Baker, who started a bank that is today known as Citibank. And his estate on the right at um, uh, Locust Valley and his consolidated commuter, Little Viking, on the left screen. Little Viking had a bigger cousin and that's the bigger cousin on the left screen. Uh, this immense, uh, I think she was 272 feet or thereabouts, um, turbo electric powered uh, yacht, um, uh, the last in a series known as Viking. And uh, it's uh, interesting to see what uh, the uh, uh, bakers had up on the davits of their great yachts. And, Indeed, uh, quite a variety of craft, including a 32-foot fan field and a, you can't quite read it, it's out of focus, but on the left screen, a Chris Craft um, launch as well. And there's Commodore George F. Baker, the Citibank uh, CEO, standing on top of a gangway right next to that Chris Craft launch. And, and we forget uh, what an important market these uh, great yachts were for uh, the, uh, for Chris Craft and, and all the other uh, launch builders at this period because these boats typically took um, uh, anywhere from four to six uh, tenders. You can see three tenders uh, visible on the left uh, uh, screen here along uh, up on Davits on, on Viking. Uh, one of the great stories of Long Island's North Shore has to do with uh, 
uh, Mr. Baker and his armada, which included not, not only Viking and Little Viking, the commuter, but a uh, couple of other boats, including a, his 72-foot uh, racing sloop, uh, because Mr. Baker uh, uh, preferred to uh, show uh, movies on Saturday nights and would often have uh, great house parties bringing uh, business friends out from the city. And rather than show his movie and movies in a room like this, he chose to do it outdoors. And his method of doing it outdoors was to have the, the motion picture projector pushed out onto the bridge of uh, the great uh, yacht, Viking. And uh, then he would uh, give a command to the crew on board the 72-foot sailboat couple hundred yards away, and they'd raise the mainsail on the sailboat, and they would project right onto the mainsail if it was a calm evening. And uh, this worked pretty well, uh, but uh, apparently uh, uh, Mr. Baker's uh, neighbor's wife uh, was uh, taken with uh, imbibing too much, and uh, one night in a drunken stupor, she walked out onto her balcony, and for some months thereafter, swore that she had seen cowboys and Indians riding down Long Island Sound. <laughs> and uh, a, uh, one of the uh, final, uh, or, or recent Commodores in New York, Jacob Man who just died a few years ago, um, Commodore Brown of um, Rhode Island, um, uh, later in the period, as, uh, as uh, the stock commuter uh, thing began, and, and uh, Chris Craft and ACF and others were making them, buys a stock commuter, and, and here we see um, his uh, ACF 38-footer on the right screen, and uh, just used, uh, he actually used it to go from, from uh, Providence, Rhode Island, to his home on, an, on uh, Fisher's Island uh, off Mystic, Connecticut. Um, and uh, that uh, same vessel on the cover of, of yachting. So, uh, so many of the people involved with that club, as Phil was saying on uh, Thursday night, uh, were commuters. But commuters, commuting was happening everywhere. It wasn't just happening uh, in New York. It was happening in so many other cities. Uh, man, I'm, I'm, uh, the, the book is on, on the commuter boats. And I don't think she fully understands. She just looked at me and said, how nice. And that was the end of our conversation. <laughs> but in size, uh, the commuters were anywhere from oh, 25 to over, well, almost over 300 feet. And they were in use uh, up to the present. And the most active period uh, was between World War I and World War II. And the principal builders of uh, commuters were Hershoff Manufacturing Company, Consolidated Shipbuilding, Purdy Boat Works, Chris Smith, and Sons Boat Company, ACF, George Lawley. And we, we'll, we're going to focus mostly on the, the 1920s and 1930s, a little beyond that. But uh, leading up to that period, there were some fantastic boats built before, before and after the turn of the century. And the, the, um, I mentioned the Esperance, the, 19, the 1869 commuter in England, and Morgan's Louisa. And this, um, let me get these buttons right. This first commuter uh, is Arrow, and she, she was uh, built in 1900 and was an, an amazing boat, really, an outstanding, she was outstandingly powerful. And she was originally built to set a world record. She was designed by Charles D. Mosher, who was a well-known steam engineer and marine architect. And uh, she was built by Sam Ayers and son in Nyack, New York. She was 130 feet long. She had a beam of 12 feet 6 inches. And the name Arrow came from her twin 3,500-horsepower uh, triple expansion steam engines. And her owner was Charles R. Flint. He was a uh, skillful entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur uh, rubber king, arms merchant, 
and he was known as the father of trust. In 1902, Arrow sliced through the measured mile at 45.6 miles an hour, which in 1902 was quite a speed, you know, over 90 years ago, and it's, it's still astounding even today. And she, she was lightly built, but she was very strong, and she saw much use for over 20 years. And among her owners were J. Stuart Blackton, the early movie pioneer and race boat driver, prominent sportsman, and Whitney, Eli Whitney also owned the boat, and they both used her as a commuter. And she was probably the first of, of what we call today muscle boats. There's another picture of her going away. This is an interesting boat. Uh, this is the awesome Tarantula. And she was built in 1902, and she was a famous triple screw. She was a W.K. Vanderbilt boat. And they, they call these small boats flyers. So their big boats were the yachts, and these little ones were the, uh, the, the flyers. And all the, all the rich men had, had two, at least. And she was notorious for his, her devastating wake. And it was caused by, by her high speeds on, on the waters around New York, around, around New York City. And Mr. Vanderbilt was actually taken to court because of this. And he, he finally had to pay up in a, a precedent-setting case whereupon the vessel's owner was held responsible for its wake. That goes back quite a few years. And if, let's see, if, yeah, this is pretty well in focus. If you'll notice the deck gun aft, and uh, this might possibly have been used to return the fire from the irate citizens on shore. <laughs> Aroused by Tarantula's wake, we don't know for sure. But there were, there were other Outstanding commuters of the period, uh, Scout, uh, Vamoose, Now Then, Stiletto, and they're all, all these boats were designed and built by the Herrschaft Manufacturing Company. Sovereign, Vatisse, Cabrilla uh, were built by Consolidated Yards. But we'll move on into the, to the 20s. Uh, this next slide is the um, beautiful, J.P. Morgan commuter, I think you saw it before, the Nevette. She was built in 1917, designed and built by Hershaw. And she was an older style, the older style um, of steam, which was favored by Mr. Morgan because she was quiet and she was fairly fast. And she used, he used her for uh, going back and forth to his home. Could you focus that a little bit, please? And um, about three years ago, I took some pictures of her, the same boat, just barely afloat, in Florida. And then, I don't, she was on her last legs, unfortunately, and was sad to see. She was about two feet below her, her water line. And she had been owned, well, by the Warren family. Uh, they bought her from, from uh, Morgan, uh, from Warren, Long Island. Or, uh, I'm sorry. Um, Warren is in, I don't know what, well, I'm not sure, but anyway, it's, there were two sisters, and they lived on the boat, they actually lived on the boat for 40 years down in LaBelle, Florida, and that's, that's where she is now, and I, I don't know whether she is uh, still afloat, but she was a beautiful old boat, and Halsey Hershaw came down to look at her a few years ago, and his idea was to cut it up into three pieces and put it on a big truck and take it back north. But uh, this never came, to, came about, unfortunately. Now, th this next slide is a, uh, a little bit different uh, from what we've been seeing and a very, uh, very significant boat. Uh, and she was designed by the then uh, forward-thinking William Hand, 
And um, he was known mostly for his, the hand motor sailors and a lot, of, uh, a lot of the sailboats that he designed. But Countess was a 40-foot V-bottom, single-screw, gas-powered, 30-mile-an-hour express cruiser. And William Hand showed what could be done with this state-of-the-art V-bottom and moderate power. She had 175 horsepower, single, and she did 30 miles an hour. And th this was one of the forerunners um, of, of the V-bottom design. It was a, a transverse planking, cross planking, and they were very successful boats. Each one was a little bit different. And up in, um, up around uh, Mystic, there are three of these, there are three of them. They're still up there, uh, one in, in Essex and two around Mystic. And they, it's, it's, a, it's a significant bow because it's one of the first uh, real V-bottom. I think um, John Hacker and, and um, Chris Smith were, were fooling with, with, the, with, the, with the bottom design at this time. But this, go, this goes, actually goes back to 1914 when he first started. Now this isn't a Navy destroyer. This is, you saw this boat before. This is the last of Peter Rouse's Winchesters. And she was built in Bath, Maine in 1919. And she was a extreme uh, destroyer type steam commuter. And she was 225 feet. And um, these, at that time, uh, right at the end of the war, the, the First World War, there were a lot of boats that were designed to resemble naval patrol boats, and uh, they, they looked like it. And today, uh, it seems that most of the yachts are designed to look like outer spacecraft, and the uh, use on, actual use on the water is sort of secondary. Uh, but Winchester was a, she was a very fast steam commuter in the 20s, and she was used in both world wars, one and two, and later owned by the Astor family, and later owned by the Vanderbilt family. And she was much more of a statement today, I think, or much more of a statement then than today's mega yachts, and she cost about as much to run as the Brazilian national debt. And one of the... Uh, one of the last of the of the Vanderbilts uh, lived on her um, in Miami. And she was at, at the city docks there for a couple of years, and, and his mother used to send him a check every month for the dockage and the upkeep of the boat. And it was somewhere around seventy five hundred dollars a month. Now to get back with in reason, um, this is. Could you focus that, please? This is a well-known boat called the Whisper, and she's a lovely example of a Purdy designed and built boat. She's 72 feet, and uh, she was built in 1921, and she had two uh, gasoline-powered 12-cylinder Allison engines. Now, these not, are not the Allison engines that we think of today. These were engines that were specially built. There were, I think, eight of them built all together. And uh, they were, at the time, when she was built in the, in the early 20s, they were $22,000 a piece. And uh, they were, as, as far as we know, they're none in existence, but they powered mostly 30 boats. And uh, this boat was built for H.L. Um, Pratt of Long Island, and it has the typical Purdy bow, uh, which is quite a bit different, and it has a smooth running around, this is a round shine hull, and if you can see in the stern there, um, a lot of the Purdy boats had a, had a uh, transom hung rudder, single rudder, and they were very, they were very effective. Um, and Purdy, although a much smaller company, uh, they were in the same in the same class as the Hairshoffs and the Consolidators and Lollies. She was a lovely boat. Uh, this is uh, Bing. Uh, she was a, 
a consolidated speedway series. She was built in 1923. And the speedway series that Consolidated built uh, were a, a, an actual uh, a design series. They call them speedways, and I think Bob explained to you why, why Consolidated uses the speedway name. But she was probably the, the, uh, one of the first ones they started building them in 1922, and um, this boat um, was, well, it was in, um, on the Chesapeake for a long time. A young family owned her, and then they sold her, and she, they restored her a bit, and when I went aboard about about three years ago, she'd never had a bilge pump on the boat. That's Pauline M., uh, another uh, consolidated, and she was a Speedway series. The, the uh, easy, easiest way to recognize a Speedway consolidated is because there was no break in the shear. She had a, uh, uh, a, uh, almost a straight shear line running forward. Uh, this, the boat you saw a little while ago, Bing, is now known as Miss Asia. This picture was taken probably two years ago, but that's the same boat, and uh, she has a couple of gasoline engines in her, and she is, uh, her home is up in uh, Edgartown now, and uh, she was on, the, I think, two of the, of the last uh, commuter rendezvous. And she's a very pretty boat. She was owned by the Astor family, and, and uh, she is, uh, I think she's now on the market. But um, Miss Asia, Mohican, Dolphin, and Ragtime, they're all of the same series, and, and they're all still in use, which is a, a tribute to their owners and also the painstaking construction methods of the consolidated yards. And consolidated, as, as Bob told you, is probably the largest builder of pleasure boats in the world. And they had at one time 13 yards, one aside from the other on the Harlem River. And they built both pleasure boats and up to 300 foot boats for the government. And this, this is Cigarette. Uh, she was a boat that was built in 1923 by Gar Wood, and she was built for L. Gordon Hammersley, and he was an avid New York yachtsman and speedboat racer. And this boat had five Gar Wood Liberties in her, and she went through, she knifed through the water um, at somewhere around 50, 50 miles an hour, and at the time, she was probably the fastest commuter in use. And she is still in existence and is being rest lovingly restored. And I hope she will uh, be back in the, in the uh, commuter fleet. And this boat was, was used, well, we can't exactly document this, but we think she was used as a rum runner. And the government uh, might, might would probably have taken her over as a patrol boat. Well, we don't. We're still looking into this. And she she was used in the so-called uh, you know noble experiment prohibition. And I don't know how many oil wells that Mr. Hammersley owned enabling him to run this thing, but uh, we hope that we'll see her in the next year or two in in her uh, original condition. I saw picture, pictures of her two or three years ago, and people were living aboard in a big straight up and down house on her, but the hull was very, I mean, you could tell that it was uh, an old Garwood hull. Uh, th this is uh, Charming Polly, and um, she was, well, similar, similar uh, to uh, Otto Kahn's Ohika that uh, Bob showed you a while ago. She was built in 1926. She was 76 feet. She was built by Lewis in, in Germany for Colonel Rogers of New York. And she was powered by two V-12 Maybach Zeppelin marine engines. 
and she was guaranteed when she before she was built otherwise the deal was off that she would cruise at 34 miles an hour which she did and uh, she was a stunning yacht commuter at that time uh, Lurison who was a big big German uh, producer of, of yachts of all time was not allowed to display at the New York boat show because of being a foreign boat and they, they had to sell boats uh, in other ways but they, they built a fine boat and unfortunately there, there were there none around now this is a very fast commuter called phantom 2 and she was built in 1927 and was a, a no-nonsense design by Tamsin King of New York City. And the boat was, was strictly built to get somewhere in a hurry. And um, they favored, the design favored the government patrol boats at the time, as you can see. And she had two 600 horsepower Wright Typhoon V12s and she was built for Pat Grant of Philadelphia and was later owned by Ralph Pulitzer of the publishing family in Port Washington, New York. And she was a striking craft built by Nevins Yard at City, City Island, and she was sim similar to Harrison Williams' whim, but without the step bottom. And this is Rascal, and she was built in 1928 by Purdy. And she was a 50-footer. She was built for Caleb Bragg, who was an automobile racer, speedboat competitor, and colorful sportsman of the jazz age. And Ra Rascal had an unusual step bottom. You can see in the picture there, uh, this where the water seems to be coming out below the water line there. And the boat was built originally uh, with a step bottom. And, and she would do 57 miles an hour, which was a, a, a tremendous speed at that time, and even today. And she was probably the fastest of the commuters on the Long Island Sound at the time. But it's said that uh, after a couple of trips, uh, or a particularly fast run across the Sound, a couple of Mr. Hammersley's guests on board lost a few of their fillings and had their dental work rearranged. And uh, Mr. Hammersley uh, finally decided just to haul the boat out and have the, the uh, step taken off the boat and re rebuilt, and uh, it resulted in probably a, a slower boat, but it probably was a lot more comfortable. This is um, a boat that probably all you people know. It's, it's a 38-foot Chris Craft uh, commuter. It was built in 1929, and uh, this, was, was, this was a boat uh, Tradition that was owned by, a math, by Mike and Ann Matheson, and uh, he sold her, uh, I guess, it last year. And she's now in Idaho, uh, Priest Lake in Idaho, and uh, I guess is in, in use a couple of months out of the year. But I've been on, been on the boat many times, and they're uh, actually they're for the 30 mile an hour speed. They're they're a pretty comfortable boat. And for two people, it wouldn't, wouldn't be too bad a, a, a cruiser to have. We went into um, the uh, Commuters 91. Uh, we came out of uh, South Street Seaport, and we were going into um, Port Jefferson, I believe it was. And this storm came in from the west, and it was, <laughs> it was quite a storm. And we just, man, the rain started to come down, then it came sideways, and we couldn't see anything, but we were just able to pick up the sea buoy and get in before it really hit. But the electricity was off, and the patrol boats were running out. But I was surprised that the, the boat was, it, it's a pretty good rough water boat. It's wet, but um, there are about 16 that we know of that are in existence. And at the latest count, I checked with Tom, and there were 65 of these boats built. Uh, and we know up to number 63, a gentleman here owns that boat. And uh, it's, I think, an indication of how well the boats were built with the power that they had, uh, that, that there are still, uh, most of them had the, the big uh, V8 
uh, Chris Kraft Motor, and they were fully equipped with china and silver, linen, everything, for $15,000 in 1930. And for $15,000 a day, I don't think you get an 18-foot boat. But it was, it was quite a bargain. Now, they must have been good boats, or there wouldn't have been that many of them left. That's Mohican. That's another one of the, of the um, consolidated Speedway series. And unfortunately, uh, she was sold and is now a commuter on the Mediterranean. She was sold to some Italian syndicate. This is ragtime. Okay, thanks. Um, and she is a 64-foot consolidated series. And this, t this book, this uh, picture was taken uh, about, two, uh, about two years ago. She was owned by Frederick Hand, uh, uh, Frederick Hard, the, the family of uh, Long Island and Connecticut for over 30 years. And um, she's presently uh, in use now. She's owned by a gentleman who owns a few boat yards uh, in the Northeast. And she's well cared for, and uh, she's been um, recently had quite a bit of money spent on the hull and is one of the last of the Speedway series and she's a beautiful example of the traditional commuter and I believe she's on the market today. Could you focus that one please? This is a very uh, historic boat very historic commuter. Um, and she's the famous William McGinnis designed commuter. She was, 19, she was built in 1930. She's 51 feet. She was built at the Lawley Yard up, up in Massachusetts. And she was built for Edsel Ford. And she had, a, she had rear controls. You can see over the, the transom there, look like two thin binnacles sitting up there, but there were controls in the, in the stern there. The boat was built originally, I think, as a commuter and a sport fisherman. And um, Ford sold her later to the Kennedy family. And you may have seen pictures of, of Jack and Jackie in the stern there, but it's in interesting to, to know that uh, when um, Joe, old Joe Kennedy went to look at the boat, uh, she was, uh, he went with uh, Walter McGinnis, and the boat needed a lot of work. And uh, Mr. McGinnis uh, suggested before they do anything, knowing that the boat was going to be used by the president and, and uh, uh, dignitaries and so forth, they removed the gasoline engines and put diesels in it. And old Joe Kennedy said, no. He said, I don't want to do that. It would be too expensive. So they still, I think they still have the same, the, well, later gasoline engines. It, the boat now is owned by the Acerno family. Uh, and uh, Mr. Acerno is a retired New York policeman, and he uses the boat as, as a... Uh, as a fishing machine every weekend. He couldn't care less who was ever on it. And the boat, it's, it's a, an outstanding boat. It's, it's not, a, not something that, that would go into a boat show, uh, but eventually I think some money will be spent on her. But she's a very historic boat, and many uh, famous people have been aboard her. And uh, one time uh, we were cruising on Lake Worth uh, when Kennedy would, would uh, come down to the compound in Palm Beach, and we were going north on, on the saga, and she was coming south, and Jackie and uh, Jack were sitting in the stern by themselves, and we went by, uh, oh, probably 50 feet apart, uh, and my three, three daughters were up on the bow, and they were waving like mad to the Kennedys and to Jackie and so forth, and, and finally, when they got abreast, the, um, 
that both Kennedys waved at the girls, and they thought that was the greatest thing that ever happened to them. And this is what got me started in this whole thing. Uh, hard to think it was 35 years ago. Can you get it in focus, please? But this is the saga. And uh, she was, of course, my favorite commuter and what brought all this about. And I um, went, well, let's go. I, I owned her in, uh, from 1960 for about six years. But she was built in 1935. And she was 69 feet, and she was designed and built by Wheeler Shipyards. Now, I've had um, a lot of controversy about John Hacker designing the boat, but he didn't. She was designed by, by John Wheeler, who was quite a designer in his own right, and, and there were many different types of, of Wheeler boats built, lap straight boats and uh, uh, fast uh, express cruisers and, and a few um, few commuters. And she was built in Brooklyn, New York. And she was built for Charles Payson, who was the brother-in-law of Jock Whitney. And the saga was really the reason that Mr. Whitney had the famed Aphrodite III built. Uh, and saga, she originally had twin um, 800 horsepower V8 Packards. And she was a hard shine V bottom boat. And uh, with the, um, she was able, to, uh, actually able to sustain a speed of over 40 miles an hour. And when I acquired her in, in 1960, um, uh, she was owned by Arthur Vining Davis in Miami. Um, he was the uh, chief executive officer of um, Alcoa, and um, she was. Well, she, she was a cruiser, and, and she had three 671s diesels in her when I bought her. And she would get, I took the middle engine out, and she would get up on top, and, main, and she would plane, and, but she was nowhere near as fast as, as she had been before. But they had both Aphrodite uh, three and uh, Saga would, would be in serious competition on the Long Island Sound to see who could get back and forth in a hurry. And they used to change engines frequently. And the engine room was back aft where, where you see the little uh, ports there. And, um, but she was, she was a fine boat. This is what she looked like when I owned her. And we used her for about six years. Okay, great. I've got to get through 150 years in 45 minutes here. But anyway, this is uh, this is what she looked like when we owned her, and she was a beloved boat. And, and, but she's no longer around, unfortunately. That's my son taking her up the the intercoastal there, trying to concentrate on keeping in the middle. That's Aphrodite. Aphrodite two, the first Aphrodite. And she was, she was built uh, uh, by Alb Albany Shipyards, and she wasn't too successful of it. I mean. And let's see. Well, this is Aphrodite III. Uh, I think a lot of you have seen this boat at some of the shows, and she is uh, now down in Florida. She's painted black, and uh, she's a 74-foot purdy. She was built for Jock Whitney, and now she's owned by John and Marge Panel. And they spent a lot of time and money and effort on her. And, and she's a, a beautiful boat and, and still in use. And I'm going to have to bring this to a close here, I guess, uh, which is probably a good time to do it. And um, there are, there's still a lot of commuters that we haven't discussed. And, and there are uh, a lot of them that are still around. And of the, there are over 300, something like 350 that we've been able to to check up on, and, and of these, uh, probably about 50 of them are in existence. And uh, I have I have some more slides here of uh, Chris Crafts, of the interior and so forth, but I, I don't think we have the time. And I would like to uh, thank Tom and Paul and Martha for uh, this uh, 
the great time we've had here, and I want to thank you people for sitting here patiently and going through all this. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Copyright 1995 by the Antique Boat Museum and the Antique and Classic Boat Society. Audio copyright 2019 Freedom Boat Service, LLC.